Actually, uh, the presentation that he's going to be bringing up was not one I really put together for today. Uh, but Chris and I uh, happened to be together at a meeting over in Hopkinsville, and he told me you were going to have this meeting here today, and wondered if I would come and talk about some of the uh, some of the things that we've uh, found out, some of our experiences with cover crops, and so. Uh, I think this particular presentation I, uh, was one I gave at the Ohio Grazing Conference. And, and so I'm not necessarily going to go through this one slide by slide, but there's some, there's some things in here I, I, I definitely wanted to pick out and uh, a few pictures that I want to show. And again, by the way, as was already mentioned, it's very informal. If I'm saying something you don't understand, want me to repeat it, or don't, don't hesitate to stop me. Uh, I love meetings like this and I love talking about cover crops because they are the foundation for us building our soils back. And we, you've heard it and we know it from experience that we spend a number of decades here in the Midwest depleting soils. And our soil biology is not what it was by any stretch of imagination. Our, our, our qualities of our soils have, have, have uh, deteriorated tremendously. Now, in the farming schedule, in, in what we are doing, we need to be working with a nutrient cycle. And so one of the things, if I'm growing a crop, uh, I want to burn carbon. I want to burn organic matter. I just like my bank account, I have to take some money out of it to live, but hopefully... I'm putting more in than I'm taking out, you know? And that's where we want to go with our soils. Uh, and, and so we want to make sure that what we're doing with our soils, we have to be productive, we have to be growing uh, full crops, but I want to be able to be building that bank account. Now, we t hear about uh, cover crops and, and we talk about all the good things that can happen from it, and that's true. There's a lot of, of awesome things that can happen. Sometimes, though, we don't talk about the things that can go wrong. And we kind of set ourselves up for failure then um, because uh, somebody gets into it and he starts to take first steps uh, and, and something goes wrong. Chris was talking about when he was a boy and they were grazing corn stalks and they used a, a, a single wire fence and the first thing that would happen is when they turned the cows out, the cows would run out and run through the fence, you know? And then you'd have to get them back in. And, and sometimes if we don't look at the ne negatives, we might, uh, we might set somebody up for a, a disappointment and then they sour on the whole subject. But, Virtually everything, when we're looking at this, all these beneficials uh, are very, very real. And while these negative impacts can also be very real, they are also very manageable. Very manageable. And so when, when we get into cover crops, it's kind of an interesting thing how I came uh, in my seed company... Uh, Ed Byron Seed is a, uh, we're owned and run by a bunch of farmers, and we were looking at forage, quality forages, getting better and better forages, primarily to create milk. We really look, what well, we were driven as far as uh, dairy, dairy quality forages. And so when this cover crop thing got kicked off, we had guys coming to us and saying, hey, you know what, we're having trouble, for example, with ryegrass like Chris was saying, we're having trouble killing it. And we said, well, shoot, we can kill it. We spent the last 10 years just trying to figure out how to keep it alive, you know? Uh, and so it was kind of an interesting thing. We were grazing uh, things like uh, turnips, brassicas, we grazed them. And of course, these, this is the poster child of the cover crop movement, uh, was, the, was the daikon radish. And, you know, of course, the argument with radishes is just like with yachts, you know, mine's bigger. But uh, anyway, it's interesting, even on that, I tell people a lot of times when we think about radishes uh, and them being the poster child, we still don't always have exactly 
uh, understand what happens with them because we talk about the bio drilling capability of it and you know that's not necessarily the fuel tank that we have here that's not the part that does the bio drilling it's the root there on the bottom side of that so maybe I don't have quite as big a, a radish as, I, as, as, as you know I'm holding there in, in my field but that tap root is really what is so critical for running down and, 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 and loosening up soils and, and, and uh, making them more productive. Now, on the dairy side of things and on the beef side of things, when we start seeing stuff like this, we get excited, you know, because when we've been feeding that old brown hay all winter and then we see forage like we were walking out in there today, you know, and w whether it was 1,700 pounds or whether it was 3,000 pounds there, it got we cattlemen kind of excited, you know, we'd have cattle we could put on that. Um, but one of the things that we need to think about and, and, and what, what, what presentations and what days like this are, are, are trying to help us think about is, is that the livestock, this particular field here, this cover crop is going for livestock production but it's not the livestock that we can see. And so out in this field, we've got a lot of livestock. And we might be able to see earthworms and some of those things, but there's a lot of microbial activity going on where we can't see, and yet it's real. And when we can bring them, thing, it will bring them in volume and we start to, to weigh them, there's a lot of livestock we have out there in, in, in the form of all these creepy, crawly things. And they have a whole lot to do with our, uh, with our soil health. And so you might see things like algae and mold that we traditionally don't think of as good that really in their place are great. And of course, the plant roots are what drives all of that. Now, uh, so I guess what we're wanting to do is shift our thinking to where we think about managing the livestock that we have under the soil rather than just what we have out um, uh, or what we see. We've got maintenance program for our cattle, we've got deworming programs, we've got vaccination programs, we've got this and that on our equipment, we've got oil changes, we've got greasing breaks, and we've got all these things, but you know, what am I doing for my soil? That's a big thing, that's, that's, that's the big question. And, and, and so, if we're going to change that, one of the huge opportunities for change is cover crop. Cover crops are fabulous for building soil, but they go to a totally new dimension when we can combine cover crops and cattle. Y'all have any cattle in Kentucky? <laughs> you don't have as many as you should. You know why I can say that? It is because I am from the great state of Illinois, and we don't have nearly as many as we should, okay? Because livestock and cover crops combined we can start doing fabulous things with soil. How much life do we have under the ground? Thousands of pounds. So we get a typical healthy soil, we're gonna have more livestock under the ground, or stocking rate, that's what we're after. We're, under, we're after a higher stocking rate <laughs> under the surface than we are above, okay? And obviously, we're about holding the soil in. And this is a very visual thing. But it's what has happened is this guy, uh, and this is a field right by me, he's putting down the uh, uh, annual ryegrass, and they ran out of seed. Now, as you can tell, looking at this soil, this was soil that he had was only in a cover crop program for a couple of years. And so the longer he's in there, the less likely you're going to see this quick deterioration because we're going to have microbiology there and there's roots going uh, that, that are helping hold that together. But it makes a huge, huge difference as far as holding our soils together. And you say, oh, I got pasture ground. I don't lose our soil. Fellas, if we do not manage our pastures, on our Kentucky hills, and by the way, the bottom 40 miles of Illinois, 
that's got Kentucky Hills. If we don't manage our pastors right, do you realize that we can have almost as bad runoff of topsoil off of our pasture ground as what our neighbor farmers do on their crop ground? If we don't have if a managed, a well-managed forage system on our permanent pastures, we can end up losing a lot of stuff there uh, as well. Now, um, again, on the, uh, on the cover crop thing, we've used this. Uh, um, by the way, talking about uh, crimson clover, this is, this is it here. That's that uh, thumb-looking head. It's beautiful. Uh, pollinators love it. Of course, I'm a bee man, too. Uh, in one of my lives, and uh, so uh, bees love crimson clover. This is crimson clover, hairy vetch, uh, the purple flower, and you can see Italian ryegrass coming up there. Yes, sir. Do you have any issues with animals eating the hairy vetch, or do they consume it? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, question was, do we have any issues with uh, uh, hairy vetch consumption? Not really. They're not going to consume it as quickly as they will some of the other forages. But what a lot of people don't realize is even when it comes to uh, on, a gra on a pasture situation, if, if we have uh, uh, a grass, uh, uh, orchard grass, alfalfa, clover, pasture, what are the cows going to eat last? The alfalfa, yeah. That's why you should always put alfalfa in pasture mixes so you know when to move the cows on when they start eating the alfalfa. You know, okay, do not talk, tell Gary Lacefield I said that. But, uh, it's, uh, but uh, you know, and, and so Harry Vatch, I see a little bit the same. Did you have problems with the consumption oh, on it? Yeah. Harry Vetch is a very unique crop and brings a lot more to us uh, than what we typically think of. We think of the, uh, of the, uh, of the nitrogen that comes from hairy vetch. <coughs> I'm here to suggest that the greatest impact on our soil life, though, from hairy vetch is actually going to be from the roots. These are roots on a field where somebody forgot <laughs> to inoculate the seed. This was uninoculated hairy vetch seed, and there was absolutely no nodulation. But this root mass is not dockered. This is simply a root mass that is washed off. There's a lot of roots there. And those roots are uh, the hairy vetch are tremendous soil builders outside of just the nitrogen production. Um, and so I'm going to say that in the cover crop program, what is happening with roots is actually the most important part. Now, obviously, nitrogen uh, capturing, sequestering is, is a great thing, too, that we can do. Uh, but the root activity in the soil is really where it is. And we talk about soil tilth, and there's a lot of things that we can do to manage that. But a lot of, as we build our soil tilth, we build our ability to hold and manage moisture, which is a, is a really, really big thing. I would like to suggest, too, we talked about compaction this morning. I would like to suggest that the compaction is, as, is a, in a grazing operation, it can be a major problem, but it doesn't need to be with a little bit of management. And when we are grazing ground where we have a lot of root mass on, and I can take the cows on here, and I graze that off, and then I get them back out, when I have all that root mass through the soil, yeah, maybe I compacted it, but those roots start to grow and move, and, 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 and that soil has a certain amount of elasticity, and there's a, 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 a sponge ability that you have where that, that stretches back out if I have roots there. But if I am out on a soil that is devoid of living roots and those cows are stumping on it, it's compacted. It's really compacted. There's a big difference there. And so uh, it's just, it, it is, it can be a problem, but again, with a little bit of management. Now, I know we have had rainstorms in the spring where we, where we had cattle move up against the break wire, and you take 120 head of, 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 of 1,200, 1,300-pound Holstein cows, <laughs> you let them stand up against the break wire wanting to move 
for a couple hours, you're going to have a mess. Now, I've been there, done that. And uh, you're going to have some, a hard time <laughs> getting that fixed back up. But uh, remember, when we have the biology going on in the soil, it will make a huge difference on the ability of that soil to spring back when we do go in there and, uh, and uh, maybe abuse it. The big thing to, to, for us to remember and why we're talking about keeping the roots in the soil is because if we're just growing our traditional crops, there's a lot of times where we don't have those living roots growing. You know, June, July, and August maybe, but from there it's pretty much downhill. Now, when we start talking about a summer annual crop, like Chris was talking about with the sorghum, um, or even with crabgrass, uh, but sorghum, sorghum sedans, millets, you know, those roots will grow long into the fall, long after the plant has stopped growing. And you go out there in a fr after a freeze uh, in November, and the top growth is long since brown. But you pull those roots up, they're still alive. They're still alive. And, and so what can we do in these months of the year to keep keep things alive because roots, active living roots is what is holding this whole infrastructure of stuff together. You know, and remember, we lose, we can lose a lot of nutrients and sometimes I, 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 I talk to fellows and I say, you know, I'm not really, uh, you know, we talk about the hypoxia zone. Okay, I am I feel badly for the people that that has affected, and, and, and I want to do my part to clean that up. But you know the saddest part of the story, not, I'm not going to say the saddest part of the story, the real sad part of the story for me is because the hypoxia zone came directly out of the pockets of the farmers of Illinois, Missouri, and Kentucky. You know what I mean? We lost nutrients because we left it get away. That's our profits that are down there. The hypoxic, okay, I'm sorry. What, 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 what we're looking at, what we're talking about the hypoxic zone at the bottom end of the Mississippi River where the Mississippi is dumping into the Gulf. And there's a huge dead zone because of a lot of the phosphorus and, 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 and excess phosphorus and nitrates that are being dumped into the Gulf. And they have come right out of the Midwest farmers' pockets. So what, what happens is, is the, the nutrients allow large algae blooms to take place in the water, so that heat is not heating up the water in the fish pocket. So there's no oxygen. Adam. You know, and obviously you get down there in the coastal areas, I mean, their livelihood is going to be coming from the water. And so uh, it's, uh, you know, like I said, it comes directly out of our pockets, or of our farmers' pockets. And so what can I do? First of all, I want to clean up the water because I want the water leaving my farm to be something that my neighbor doesn't care to have run over his land, Okay. I do want to be that type of neighbor. But secondly, if I can keep that money in my pocket or on my farm or in the bank, if you please, your bank of the soil, that's going to make a big difference. And so that, that's why I challenge farmers to look at that. Now, here is, a, here is, a, uh, is a, a, a test that was done up in Indiana. And what we're looking at is the amount of nitrogen in the soil uh, following corn. And so you can see the fertility program. It wasn't outrageous, but it was on a good ground. You had 165 uh, bushel yield. But when we came in and took the samples at the beginning of December, there was 116 pounds of nitrogen. Now, that was where no cover crop was seeded. Now, where the cover crop was seeded, 
And this was in late August, and so there was 12 pounds of, uh, and that Cabo Royals, it's an annual ryegrass, and so it's a, usually a fairly winter hardy annual ryegrass. Marshall is another one that uh, we can, you had pretty good winter hardiness with that one. But an annual ryegrass seeded in there, so it's going to capture some of these, it's going to capture these nutrients when they look for the nitrogen where the KB Royal or the ryegrass was growing. Where the rye annual ryegrass was going, we're looking at only 12. Yep. Mm hmm. Do you have an answer for that? I'm not quite sure if I followed exactly yeah, what he no, was saying. I know sa exactly what you're saying. So in, in that particular year, you're saying you had a, a four-year year. corn average. You know, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, okay. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 165 bushel. Maybe that was 225 bushel corn. Cor right. But now I, here you see what he put on. I mean, so they did have, what, that's why I was saying it wasn't an exorbitant amount. Yeah, I'm sorry. I follow. I, was forgetting you were talking about the 2012 exactly and that was a that was a year where there was a boatload of stuff left and exactly right we should have probably been able to take this 116 and maybe convert that into another 50 bushel okay so we have another 50 bushel and then we're going to cut this back let's say we cut it back to 50 okay and then maybe that is even more real. But my point is that when we had all of that out there, by simply putting 10 pounds or 12 pounds of ryegrass down, where is it? It's not in the soil. It's all in the plant. It's in the plant root and in the top growth. It's captured in a form that's going to keep it out of the tile and consequently out of the Ohio and out of the Mississippi in the farm. It's going to stay in the farmer's pocket. See what I'm saying? And all of that nitrogen, it was here. It was over here, but we just converted it into a stable form. Now, where he did nothing, the question is how much of that 116 is going to be left? And, and, and my, my, my answer, I'm not going to give an answer on that so much as I'm going to say, what's your average bean yield on your good ground here? 60? Okay, 60, good yield. How much nitrogen credit do you give that on your application of nitrogen on corn following soybeans? Are you using cover crop? Do you think you get a pound per bushel? <laughs> and that's what, we, that's, what we, that's what we have traditionally said. Here's what's happened is part of the reason earlier when our organic matter levels were higher... We hung on to that better in spite of the fact that we didn't have cover crops there because we had a higher organic matter that was helping hold some of that and keep it around a little longer. As we depleted our soils down and we dropped down into twos and below twos, we don't have so much holding capacity there anymore. And so I've got guys up in some good ground in Illinois that are raising 60 and 70 bushel soybeans and they're not given a pound credit that's crazy the reason they're not given a pound credit though guys is because they don't have it it went away because they didn't have anything to hold it there so that's pretty, if you, if you are able to, you should have that, yes you should be able to get that 60 pound 60 pound soybean, or is it 60 bushel? You should have 60 pounds there. These guys are crediting it. And in fact, this fellow is, is, is he would go out and, and he, would, he would definitely be giving 80 to 100 pound credit on his next crop of corn. And that's, that's what we're looking for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.
Wow. Uh, do you still tar and feather people here? <laughs> Is it as bad as it sounds? Yeah, I'm afraid it is. I'm afraid it is because we're saying the foundation to all soil life is roots. And if I'm going to eliminate top growth, I'm eliminating bottom growth as well. And, 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 and like was mentioned this morning, nature abhors a vacuum. The way the Creator has designed this thing, you look out at the, at, at the plots out there, you, anybody see those purple flowers out there? That's a natural cover crop. I'm not telling you how you have to manage your water because water hemp is, that's a big problem. And, and we've, it's not the only problem that we're dealing with. But I do believe that with proper soil building practices, we can get ourselves to where we can manage our problems much better. I think we have created our problems by deteriorated soil health. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it absolutely can, and, 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 and I, think, I think the judicious use of cover crops is definitely a way that we can, we can bring into control a lot of the weeds that are, are being major issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Okay, we were talking about, Chris was talking about below ground amounts of, uh, of, uh, 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 of roots. So in an acre of that ryegrass that they were showing us out there, in one acre of ryegrass, you reckon there was 30 miles of roots? How many think that sounds far-fetched? Oh, it's there. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's 30 miles there. What about 300? Ah. Now we're talking, oh, well, uh-oh. Remember the figure that Chris gave? It's a whole lot more than 200. Oh, that's a whole lot more than 2,000. He said 20,000. You want to blow your mind? Under every acre, 300,000 miles of roots? Wow. Wow. That is huge. That is huge, and that is the answer of what we can grow. That, that, blows, that, that just blows your mind. Ten ton of roots, feeding that, doing all the things that we need it to do. We have this ryegrass dropping down. We have permeation in the soil. We have it going deeper than what our soybean and corn crops are ever going to get, uh, except that the neat thing that happens is our corn and soybeans follow the ryegrass roots down and we start creating root channels and everything starts going down deeper and it's just a win-win. Like I said, I love cattle uh, out on these fields is because when we can take these cattle and by the way, these cover crops, anybody notice anything about this cow? What you would never want to tell a woman? She's fat, yeah. But that's what we like in cows. And so she's fat. These forages will really make some fat cows. In fact, we can get cows too fat. Because these cover crops growing in crop residue, and all of a sudden, gleaning fields is no longer just a marginal thing. But I'm telling you what, we are putting serious weight on cows. Stockers, however you want to go with it. We love perennial pastures. This is what we like. We like to have this 365 days out of the year. Guess what? It's not going to happen. We're going to have to have some permanent pastures that we're going to use, but we're going to have to have maybe some warm season. Some of the warm season crops, like uh, Chris was talking about uh, sorghums in summer, uh, sorghum sedans, these type of things, we can come up with root systems that are amazing. Now, they might not necessarily keep up with a perennial warm season prairie grass like this, but still, we can do some tremendous things with these warm season. This is uh, just looking at, uh, at nitrogen production from the legumes because sometimes that's what gets we farmers excited because that means less nitrogen so we can save some money, and it's true. Our cover crops need to cut down on our fertility inputs. But I challenge fellows when you're starting out with a cover crop, don't cut back on your inputs too quick because if we cut back too quick, we can... We, we, <laughs> 
until we really get the biological life and cycle moving in the direction that we want, if we cut back too quick, we can hurt ourselves. This is above ground growth, and this is uh, this is getting back into uh, into uh, Chris's uh, old country. I mean, uh, north of Virginia, but still, we're looking at at over 200 units of nitrogen on top growth alone. How much is organic matter worth? You've seen this slide, and we can put our numbers in, but I tell you what, really, I think we're organic matter, and by the way, if we're going to change our organic matter and build our organic matter in soils, we're going to have to do it with root action. This is where organic matter really shows its value. Bare soil is only going to hold basically an inch per organic matter point. Uh, if we've got soils out there that is, uh, that is pastures that are running in the four or five range, we can hold about that much moisture, water, that many inches of water. So for every point on organic matter that we can raise in our crop ground, it gives us an extra inch of water that we can hold there. That, by the way, is 27,000 gallons. Okay? And when I can keep that in the sponge of my soil, I enhance my drought capability, handling capabilities tremendously. But fellas, we got pasture in southern Illinois. Maybe y'all don't in Kentucky, but we got pastures in southern Illinois that are way below this. That's too bad, but it's the way they were managed. And we lost organic matter, and so we got pastures that are only going to hold two inches of water. And that's all we're going to get. So if I can turn around and change my use grazing management, and, and I can correct my management on those pastures, build my organic matter there to where I can hold two more inches, huh, I can get by with that irrigation. That's pretty neat. Um, you know, here is one of the things that I, this is, this is, is coming from University of Missouri. But they have areas that they have been managing. I, one of my uh, associates is Chad Hale. Uh, he lives in Oregon, but he uh, got his degree at University of Missouri. Uh, and they have, uh, they have this continuous going study. Um, and, you know, the fact of the matter is when we think of Timothy grass as being a sod forming, sod building, it's not even one of the strongest ones, really. But grass, continuous grass, can or did make a huge difference. But now, notice the difference where they had a six-year rotation where they brought two years of hay in. It allowed them to hang on to a lot more of the topsoil, okay? Uh, and they could, but still not the same as grass, but this is... It, what we're after is what we're trying to say is show is what we can start to do with cover crops in our crop cropland. Now, one of the things that they get me to talk about sometimes is tillage and cover crops because most guys will not talk about tilling this type of thing, uh, this, this under. And I understand that. I understand that. And I'm not here to promote tilling. But I'm here to tell you, if you are a farmer that does not incorporate no-till practices on all your farm acres now, you for sure need cover crops because we can help to mitigate the damage that we do. Okay? And so I work with some farms, who, and, and I work with a lot of farms, and, and incidentally, where they would take a, 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 a crop like this on organic farms, they will turn it under, and how much biomass are we talking about there? About five, uh, 5,200 pounds. And so we're going to bring that down on a dry matter basis of about 7,000 and give us about 3,000 pounds of pure carbon. And so some of those organic farmers will take that and they'll actually turn that under. Now, when you till soil, it is bad for the soil. But here's the thing. When they're tilling these cover crops under, all they will do is one more hit of a spring tooth hair and that's ready to plant. Okay? Minimizing that tremendously, but the root action in there of these cover crops is helping to make this soil much more durable and sustainable. Am I promoting tilling? No, 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 no. 
Not at all. I'm just telling you that whatever our farming practices are, and I have a lot of fellows who are using uh, like minimum till, strip till, and so forth, and that works, works very well in the cover crop uh, side of things. I, I don't care what we're doing. We need cover crops, okay? And, and, and obviously the less tilling we can do, the better. Understand. But I'm just saying... Whatever we do, we must bring these cover crops. And this talking about nutrient tie-up, I'm just going to skip over that. There's a lot of different rooting actions, but these, these crops work together, and, 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 and we're careful as we're selecting, as, as your extension guys are helping you select different crops uh, for different things. Here, of course, is the ryegrass roots. <laughs> you know, you start to see what can be done with those. Now... This ground was ground that was harvested. There was crop farm, uh, and then a cover crop was planted on that in August. And this cover crop consists of oats, annual ryegrass, uh, I believe some tillage radish, and turnip. And then this fall it comes on. It's just a beautiful, beautiful bee farm. It's up by uh, Vandalia, Illinois. Some of the best, it's a, it's a fantastic herd of, of, uh, of black cows. They're all registered Angus. Uh, uh, but uh, they, he is out there grazing this, moving this. He moves this brake wire four times a day. He says, uh, I like moving the brake wire. He said, I like being out with the cows. And so he is uh, was moving that brake wire. This, I, I actually took this picture, I think it was in uh, Jan or, uh, late December, early January. And I said, now, do you have any problems with the, w w when, w when you're running the cover crop this way? And he says, yeah, he says, I I'm running into a really big problem. I said, what's that? And he says, well, I got two silos that are full of really good corn silage and he said I have no idea when I'm going to use them because he said the way these cover crops are holding out he said I'm feeding a little bit of a hay in the background uh, and and he said I'm not going to run out of uh, cover crop until sometime in late February <laughs> um, I asked him about compaction on that, and this is what he told me he would do. And again, I'm not saying one way is right. I'm simply saying this is what is being done. He comes in with a chisel uh, plow and chisels at once because he said most of my compaction that I'm going to have here is going to be surface in the top couple inches because as he grazes out, he doesn't just keep running the cows over it. He goes on and harvests and gets, get harvest and, and gets them off. But... Uh, these are cows eating uh, turnips, um, and they like them. Now, when it comes to grazing brassicas uh, and turnips, uh, it, uh, as Chris said, if you have something else in with them, it helps. But some of the guys asked me, he said, when I turn the cows out on radishes or turnips, they don't want to eat them right away. And I said, no. I said, because it's, it's, it's like beer. It's an acquired taste. The first time they eat it, they don't like it. But give them about three days, and then they start doing this and reaching under. Uh, and, and the nutrient value here, again, I pulled quite a few. Uh, I've actually seen protein levels go into the low 30s. And again, energy values not far off of good corn silage. All right, that's cover crop that grew too tall. Um, a lot of options that we have uh, taking, taking uh, uh, cover crops into beef production. Uh, this is actually a fellow on this particular pasture. This is permanent now, but it is a fellow who grazes finishing animals. He puts half of his weight of these animals on from, from grain and the other half from forage. That's pretty high. If you've finished cows, you know you feed a lot of grain, you know, especially on the end. He is finishing them on half forage and half grain. Uh, and I, I personally know his cattle buyer, and he sells on the rail. These cattle grade out. He goes and buys 
cow calves of the sale barn variety <laughs> and he pieces them together so he's he's a true cowboy he loves cows and he can take a a thin calf or he says you know I can make that one work I can bring it around and I and that's what he does and so you can see it's a mixture but he's finishing these animals on 50 percent forage 50 percent uh, uh, grain um, you say well at three dollar fifty cent corn is that a big deal yeah, I still think it's a big deal. Still think it's a big deal. Uh, it's obviously not like when we had eight-dollar corn, but um, I, I, I guess I guess what I'm saying is so often in the beef business. How many guys are beef here today? Of the live, uh, okay. How many are dairy? Do we have any dairy? Okay, so we're all we're all looking at, at on beef. So often in the beef industry, we have looked at at our our forage as well, we make do with it, you know? And it's kind of something to carry our cows, keep them out of the mud. Uh, and we don't necessarily look at it as being able to pack on serious amounts of weight gain. But I'm saying with managing our pastures, with incorporating cover crops, we can put a lot of gain on these animals. I work with a group in northern Indiana that that markets uh, does a tremendous amount of grass finished beef and they do it right and in fact their animals I don't have a picture of that on this uh, on this presentation but their animals would look just like this good looking good looking guy and your nice rumps on good curves I mean they got loins on and they're finished out right and they do it on animals that are 18 months or less. So if we're going to do that, that's the power of forages, of what we can do. Uh, and so incorporating, we can use warm season, and, 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 and Chris, I'm sorry if I didn't really go, uh, I, I didn't hit a lot on the warm season uh, uh, production. I think on warm season, one of the most underutilized opportunities for cover crops is warm season cover crop following wheat harvest. Now we're always gonna double crop beans because you gotta double crop beans, right? Any of you get sick and tired of double cropping beans when you're combining beans in the snow in November? Have you always have them out before then? I'm suggesting, I'm suggesting if you do wheat and if you have cattle, you can grow some amazing fertilizer. Instead of growing the soybeans, uh, you can grow some amazing fertilizer in August and September and convert that into tremendous stimulation of soil biology. If you have cattle that can graze that. Uh, in fact, I've got one fellow in Missouri who grazes every year, and, and he's a sheep farmer. But he grazes, he'll take a, uh, a mixture of, of, of a, a brachytic dwarf forage sorghum and cow peas and, uh, oh, he may throw in there uh, uh, about 10 pounds of soybeans. Uh, and I think he throws in a little bit, maybe a little bit of tropical sun hemp. Tropical sun hemp gets pretty woody, but sheep need a little bit of fiber too. And he just plants that in August, uh, late July, and lets it grow up. And the whole thing frosts off and turns brown. And when he's done grazing his cool season pastures, he grows, it goes in and grazes stockpiled warm season forages until February with his sheep. That's outside the box. <laughs> uh, but it works very good, and he does it year after year after year. So you know it's working well. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of great ways to go about this. And there's a lot we don't know. Um, if you think I know a lot, I can tell you there's a whole lot more I don't know. And I wish I did. And that's why I love days like this and, and being able to work with uh, Chris and the group here because we're, we're, we learn together. There's so much to find out. But guys, I know one thing. There is... Not a question in my mind that by managing cover crops, especially cover crops with livestock, you can
drastically improve the uh, financial success of your farm.